So we are going to talk today about serving male victims um, of domestic violence and sexual assault within our crisis programs and review a little bit about what that looks like, what some challenges are. Um, you know, as advocates, we already know that domestic violence doesn't know any gender, race, socioeconomic boundaries. While it's true that the majority of victims are women, many men around the world experience violence at the hands of intimate partners. And often male victims are very reluctant to report their abuse or to seek help for a variety of reasons, many of which revolve around the fear that they will be judged or disbelieved or that they are unable to access services based on their gender. So we're gonna talk about all of those things today. So first of all, what does the law say? VAWA, FIPSA, VOCA, as well as our state guidelines all contain protections for male survivors. Um, the non-discrimination guidelines of all of these um, laws and funding sources include um, providing equitable access to service to all survivors, regardless of, you know, race, color, religion, national, uh, uh, sorry, national origin, um, as well as gender and gender identity. So um, gender is protected class under VAWA, FIPSA, and VOCA, as well as the Tennessee state standards. Providing equitable services means that each service provided by your organization should be available to all clients, and this includes shelter services. The VAWA non-discrimination grant condition provides that a recipient of VAWA funding may offer sex segregated or sex specific programming only when it is necessary to the essential operation of the program. The Department of Justice requires any program that receives a complaint of discrimination based on sex segregated services to justify their use of this type of service. So if you're going to separate your services and, and have, you know, for example, one support group for men and a separate support group for women. You have to justify why you have made the decision to separate these services. It's also important to note that shelters can't turn away male survivors from services just because another shelter resident may be uncomfortable with their gender. So just because a woman in shelter may be uncomfortable with having a male survivor also living in shelter, that is not an excuse to turn away a male survivor from your services. You may have to relocate or rehouse that female survivor who's uncomfortable and find her another shelter to go to. You cannot turn away survivors based on their gender. <clears throat> Should you decide that segregating a service such as shelter is necessary to the operation of the program, because remember I said if you do make this decision, you have to justify your decision. Um, and your justification cannot be, because that's how we've always done it, your justification cannot be because some survivors or some residents may be uncomfortable. Your justification has to be based in reasoning of how it allows people to receive better services. The reason for you separating the services have to be because separating them allows the groups to receive better services. It can't just be, well, we've always separated them 
or someone might be uncomfortable. It has to be a legitimately um, beneficial reason to the survivors. Anyway, um, if you do choose to segregate services or separate services, then it must be able to offer equitable services to clients of all genders. So, for example, many um, agencies still go the route of hoteling male victims, that is providing them a stay in a hotel rather than a stay in their shelter. So let's look at that. Let's think about what we have to think of in terms of providing equitable services if we choose to hotel male victims. Well, for one thing, we have to think about length of stay. For example, if the program offers female clients who are staying in shelter an initial stay of 45 days with potential of extensions, the male survivor's hotel stay must offer an equal time period. So if you're staying, a woman who comes into our shelter can stay for, you know, 30 days, 45 days, whatever it is, plus opportunities for extensions, depending on their circumstances, you have to offer that male client who you're housing in a hotel the same length of stay. And most agencies can't provide that because of monetary reasons, among other things. So right off the bat, hoteling a male victim is not an equitable service. Access to supplies is another consideration. If your program provides clients in shelter access to meals, a food pantry, toiletries, clothing items, or, or any other supplies during their stay, these same concessions must be made for male victims in a hotel. If you're providing an open kitchen and access to food and meals, which you should be providing within your shelter, but you're not offering those same supplies and those same concessions for male victims in a hotel, it's not an equitable service. Another consideration is access to services. For example, if a program offers additional services to shelter clients, such as support groups, case management, parenting classes, housing assistance, etc., these same services must be offered to male victims. Also, you have to pay attention to the ease with which clients can access services. If a support group is offered within the walls of the shelter, what transportation is available for male victims to access this service? If advocates are available on site in shelter 24 hours a day, what steps are being made to ensure that a male victim in a hotel receives the same level of access to service? And a final consideration is privacy. And this is something that you may not even consider, but shelter is a challenging environment. You know, it's characterized by a need for communal living and a loss of privacy because you end up living with a group of other people. Hotel accommodations give male victims access to a level of privacy and autonomy not necessarily available to women in shelter spaces. So it's not equitable. So, you know. These are just some things that you have to really be thinking of when you're considering separating your services and particularly when you're considering housing male victims at a different location or hoteling them um, as opposed to finding space for them in shelter. And on top of this, you know, on top of equitable services, providing male victims with hotels or making them stay somewhere else that's not shelter property feeds into a lot of misconceptions that male victims may have about seeking services. So let's talk about those misconceptions as well. One of the big ones is that shelters don't help men. 
And when male victims are hearing that, well, if you seek this out, um, if you seek out shelter services, if you seek out emergency shelter and safety, they're going to put you in a hotel for two nights and then you're not, you're on your own. You're proving this misconception, right? You know, many male survivors are afraid that they won't be able to access services or that services are simply not available for men. So it's really the responsibility of each program to make sure that its community outreach includes marketing services that are available to survivors of all genders. You know, when you're doing your website or when you're going out into your community and doing table events, are you making sure that you are letting folks know that you serve survivors of all genders, that you serve male victims? Um, on your brochures and on your outreach materials, are you making it known that you serve victims of all genders? Another misconception is the fear that gay or transgender men will be outed. Many of these folks may believe that they will have to reveal their sexual orientation or gender identity in order to receive shelter services. This can be especially scary in rural communities where there's already danger associated with their identities. Advocates should make sure that clients seeking services know that it is enough to identify as a victim of violence to receive services and you don't have to go into the details of your gender identity or your sexual identity. Um, and that although some demographic information may be asked, make sure that clients know that it's not mandatory that they answer those, those personal demographic questions. Advocates should also reassure clients that their organization's privacy and confidentiality policies are, are secure and that they are you know, strictly held to those policies. And then there's an idea that men who seek help are weak. Um, many men don't seek help because they fear it'll make them seem weak or it'll call into question their sexuality or their masculinity. Advocates should make sure to reassure male clients in particular that being abused is not a weakness. You know, that they're, that Seeking help and seeking safety requires a lot of bravery and walking away from an abusive situation, an abusive partnership requires a lot of bravery and that recognizing that when you're in need of help and you go get that help, it's a sign of strength. So. Here are some considerations for sheltering men. And first of all, we need to understand that many programs consider segregated shelter services because they're uncomfortable with the notion of housing male and female survivors in the same place. And this comes from, you know, some notions of outdated gender roles and outdated understanding of survivors' needs and safety. So let's talk about some of these issues. One thing that I hear from a lot of agencies who are still struggling with sheltering men is that they think that the female survivors within their shelter will be afraid if they bring men in. And so the reality is that domestic violence programs should be striving to empower their clients to live independent, safe and fulfilling lives. Part of this process is understanding that survivors will have to interact with individuals of all genders in their everyday lives when they work and live outside of shelter. It's also important for advocates to reinforce the reality that not all men are abusers. Most men are not abusers. Some advocates may be surprised to find that many, if not most women in shelter, don't consider all men threats and are open to the prospect of sharing shelter with male survivors because they understand that they share common experiences and common history of violence and search for safety. The presence and acceptance of individuals of all genders can have a positive impact on a survivor's healing journey. And if an advocate really believes that the addition of a male survivor to a shelter community will be received 
negatively by the women in shelter, then the advocate has a responsibility to have a discussion with shelter residents and remind them of the program's non-discrimination policy and address concerns that they may have. It's important to note that shelters don't have to house male and female survivors in shared bedrooms, although some have and they've done it with great success. It's the practice of many shelters to house male survivors in their own separate bedroom and many have a male bathroom as well. Another idea that I hear a lot is that it's somehow inappropriate for men and women to share space. And so I just want to address that by saying there is nothing inherently inappropriate or immoral about housing male and female victims in one shelter. The assumption that male and female survivors, when they're housed together, will engage in sexual behavior is misguided and short-sighted. It erases, first of all, LGBTQ sexual identities and assumes that sexual behavior in shelter might only take place between clients of opposite genders. And I assure you that sexual behavior is taking place between female residents already. Additionally, it's not up to shelter staff to police the sexuality of consenting adult clients. So the flip side of this idea that female survivors will be afraid is that male survivors will be alone or uncomfortable in women's space. This misconception is rooted in the idea that shelter is inherently a woman's space and that only women can be victims of domestic violence. This is a damaging myth that erases the lived experience of victims of other genders and perpetuates the idea that men are not able to receive shelter services. This also helps maintain this outdated patriarchal idea that men and women are so fundamentally different that they can't possibly go coexist in a meaningful way. This is the opposite of the empowering, equality-focused ideals that really should be central to meaningful anti-violent shelter work. And so the last one here is that if we allow men into shelter, many of the men could be abusers trying to gain access to their victims or trying to victimize others. Listen, while it is certainly possible for abusers or simply violent individuals to gain access to shelter services, this is not a phenomenon that is restricted to men. Advocates have a responsibility to understand that while the majority of abusers are men, the majority of men are not abusers, and that women and those of other genders may also be abusers or engage in violent behavior in shelter. For this reason, the four central shelter rules that you all know include a ban on violent behavior in shelter already, and violence is grounds for immediate exit from shelter services. The expectation is that the shelter environment is one that rejects both emotionally and physically violent behavior. And I have to say that the instances that I have been told of in the past couple of years of abusers actually gaining access to shelter, all of those instances have been female abusers who have gained access to shelter services. The fear of allowing abusers into shelter is understandable. It's valid, but advocates must be aware that this possibility is a present with abusers of any gender, not just men. And advocates should be practiced in recognizing red flags when they're talking to people who are seeking entrance into shelter. And like I said, it is just as likely, if not more so, that female abusers are seeking access to shelter because it's much easier to get in the door than it is for male victims. So when we're thinking about red flags, from people of any gender, 
let's talk about what you might see. That it could include like things like demanding to be seen as a victim, insisting um, what makes abusers even more convincing is the fact that oftentimes they genuinely feel victimized if the partner resists their control. Blaming their behavior on external factors such as alcohol and anger and using that to play into their victimization as well. Giving in it, um, innocent answers for abusive behavior, like I just want her to talk to me, I just want him to understand how I feel, he just thinks I'm stalking her, blaming their partner for their behavior, you know, she's just a bitch or he hit me first. <coughs> exaggerating their own injuries and minimizing their partners. Using abusive language toward the advocate. Recognize the limits of your own knowledge that batterers are skilled manipulators, that they're accustomed to convincing others of this innocent character they want to portray. So if you do end up with someone in the shelter who behaves in an abusive or violent manner, remember that every person is responsible for their own decisions and that violence is a choice. So some ways that you can learn to recognize red flags in both male and female offenders is thinking about the context in which behavior occurred. You know, if they're telling you about an incident where they did use violence. Think about the context. Was it violence as a way to protect themselves, violence as a way to escape or protect someone else? Um, you know, protective, you know, self-protection or self-defense? Or was it offensive violence? Was it violence as a means of control and punishment? So think about that context because we know that oftentimes victims, we still have an issue around the state of dual arrest or victims being arrested for defensive violence. Think about the meaning or context of a behavior. What impact does the context have on the self-determination of each person in a relationship? So what I mean by that is, again, who is controlling? and who is making the decisions and maintaining power? What is the intent of the power? What is the effect of the behavior? Survivors are more likely to empathize with or make excuses for their partner's behavior. Abusers lack empathy and will often blame their victim or dismiss abuse or dismiss their feelings. And at the end of the day, it's really about looking for agency. Who's making the decisions? Whose decisions are coerced? Whose life is getting smaller and more controlled and more isolated? And whose life is getting bigger? You know, this is a process. Use your active listening skills. Use open-ended questions. If something feels wrong, Keep exploring. Listen for red flags. Um, it's okay to also check with peers and coworkers and supervisors when wet red flags come up or if you feel unsure. Also consider red flags not only in the context of interaction with clients, but also when you're hiring new staff, when you're interviewing new volunteers, new interns, new board members, get familiar with red flag behavior. But also remember that anger is an appropriate response to trauma. You know, when someone has been victimized by someone that they're supposed to trust, when someone has been hurt and abused, when somebody has been potentially, you know, blamed, you know, blamed by family, blamed by friends, blamed by other systems even that are supposed to protect them, 
you know, what were you wearing or why didn't you leave sooner? Or, you know, he really is a nice guy and I don't believe he would do that. Anger is an appropriate response. So when somebody calls your hotline and they're frustrated or angry, um, understand that expressions of healthy anger and expressions of frustration are normal. What's not normal is abusive language, name calling, you know, calling the advocate names, threats, you know, those types of things are where anger turns into red flag behavior. I also want to make a quick note about serving teen boys in shelter. Uh, many shelters across the state are still really struggling with providing services to teen boys, um, even though banning teen boys um, from shelter is prohibited if they're coming in with their parent or guardian. The continued practice of banning teen boys from shelter presents a difficult barrier for many survivors. And you know, a lot of the issues with serving teen boys are the same issues that I addressed or the same concerns that I addressed that um, agencies are saying, you know, we have this concern with serving men, they have those same concerns with serving teen boys. But the, the biggest problem is that it puts a burden or a barrier for survivors getting help. Um, you know, so while research tells us that battering behaviors can be passed down, which is often the concern uh, from the batter to children, including girls, the more significant finding is that the majority of cases are not passed down. Uh, teenagers can and do choose nonviolence and healthy and respectful relationships. Domestic violence programs can provide a source of support and encouragement for these healthy choices, as well as healing from abuse and trauma that teens have witnessed. Shelter staff have a responsibility to model clear expectations, um, and empower and serve all residents. Excluding teen boys from shelter is not only prohibited by law, but it forces survivors to make a difficult choice to seek safety at the expense of their child or to stay in an unsafe place to stay with their child if they can't bring their child to shelter. It also reinforces to the teen boy that he's not trustworthy or worthy of safety at all. It's the responsibility of advocates and crisis programs to serve the needs of all primary and secondary victims, regardless of their gender. So do we have any questions or concerns about the information we talked about today, about serving male victims, about what that looks like, about the myths and misconceptions? If you have any questions, you can type them in your chat box. You can also email me at any time. My email is right here on the screen. If you have any questions or concerns, I'm going to give a few minutes for you all to um, ask some questions. One question is, if not serving teen boys is prohibited by law, how do shelters get by with that? It's the same way that they try to get around not serving men. They cite this idea of fear, of potential violence, of you know women in shelter feeling unsafe or it being inappropriate. Um, so, you know, it's the same struggle that many shelters have with not serving men is they lump teen boys into that category. And let me be very clear that, you know, any shelter who receives any federal or state funding is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of gender. So you must be serving men, you must be serving 
teenage boys. If men make the request not to be roomed with a woman, is that reasonable? Yes, I think it's absolutely reasonable. I think it's also reasonable for a woman to make the request not to be roomed with a man. Um, survivor safety and comfort and understanding of their trauma is reasonable. Now that may be, you know, if somebody makes that request, then that may become an issue of, well, if you, if you don't feel comfortable, I understand that, but that means that we, you know, are out of bed space because the only bed we have open may be in the room with a woman. So we may then have to try to work with you to help you find another shelter to go to that has more bed space open. But, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, it's about accommodating those issues. Are most shelters putting single women and women with children in the same room? Absolutely, it happens all the time. Um, many shel a couple of shelters across the state have completely separate um, areas or wings um, for women with children versus single women, but many um, cross over. So you will have single women that are in the room with families. It just depends on the layout and the bed setup and what that looks like. Other questions? Okay, I have a couple coming it looks like, so I'm gonna wait. Um, again, I will let you know that this has been recorded, so I will send out a link to the recording along with a copy of the slides and your webinar certificate. Um, I will send that out probably later this afternoon. All right. Um, okay, a couple of people have said that they're gonna email me questions. That's perfectly fine. If you think of questions that you would like to send me in an email or if you would like to chat later, please don't hesitate to contact me. I appreciate you all being on the line and being patient with our um, technical difficulties this morning and I will talk to you next time. Thank you.